Thank you so much. I'm Bishop Matt.00.5. Uh, it's an incredible privilege for me to be up here tonight in this role. Uh, I did not anticipate ever being up here, but you know, God has a way, doesn't he? Of calling us to places and seasons and times and roles that we never anticipated. Bishop Matt introduced my wife Melanie and my daughter Melissa, or Jessica, who is here. Our daughter Melissa is watching on live stream, as, as Bishop Matt said. I think our three grandsons are also watching with our son-in-law, David Haslam. But for our family, uh, we are just so humbled to be here and to be with you in this role. I also have to say what a privilege it will be to work with Bishop Linda Adams, Bishop Keith Cowart. Uh, I feel blessed to be working with this team of leaders as we go forward together. As a seminary student, 24-year-old seminary student, I woke up one morning and noticed that I couldn't hear out of my left ear. My hearing was gone. It was so strange. Went through a whole series of tests at the Health Sciences University in the Portland area where we were living, going to seminary. Went through all the tests and they came back uh, at the end of the whole process and they said, you have a hearing loss in your left ear. I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, I, I know that. And over the years, I've had a number of, of surgeries to try to correct that. None of them really ever worked. After one of those surgeries on my skull to implant a bone-anchored hearing device, the surgeon came out and he said to Melanie, I was, you know, coming out of the anesthesia, so I wasn't quite completely there. He said, uh, Melanie, your husband has the thickest skull I have ever seen. <laughs> so I'm a member of the Thick Skull Club. So you'll learn if you want to talk to me in terms of having me respond, you need to be on my right side. On my left side, it's just completely blank. I, I was laughing today because in the panel, if you saw the Board of Bishops panel, the new Board of Bishops, the outgoing Board of Bishops, uh, great Q&A back and forth that Bishop Matt facilitated. And one of the questions that Bishop Matt asked was if there was any advice that the outgoing bishops had for those of us incoming bishops. And so Bishop Roller responded, uh, talked about having one ego. Do you remember that response for those who were here and how we celebrate with one another in the role and the wins that the church has together? And I was, uh, I was in our Pacific Northwest Conference meeting talking with Pastor Joshua Brooks from my conference, and he said, wasn't that neat what Bishop Roller said about having one ego? And I said, one ego? I thought he said one eagle. <laughs> I, I'm honestly up here. And Bishop Roller has a, such a wild sense of humor. I'm thinking one eagle. Okay, maybe like flying or the, <laughs> the wind or something. I, I didn't quite know exactly what that means. But one of the realities of having a very significant hearing loss is that it's really hard for me to tell where sound is coming from. Like if you are behind me, for example, you could be over there, over there, over there. I have no idea where the sound is coming from. And I've learned to recognize when I hear sound to turn around to try to figure out what direction it's coming from. And I think for many of us, it feels like in this culture that we're in, we're inundated with messages and voices and we ask ourselves, what, what is this about? Where, where is this coming from? What does this mean? And it almost feels like not only can we not tell what the sound means, we can't tell where it's coming from, or more importantly, how we should respond. I'm very thankful that the Scripture helps us. We're grounded in the Scriptures. And the Scriptures have defining texts in the Old and the New Testament that help us understand how to live in this crazy culture that we're in, and how we respond. One of those texts that has been on my heart the last several weeks in anticipation of, of being here is the dedication of the temple that we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and chapter 7. I don't know if you've read that passage recently, 
But as I was reading that, studying about that, and praying about that, I was thinking about uh, some implications for us as a, as a family, as a denomination. And I believe in this story of the dedication of the temple, there are principles that we need to hear as a denominational family as we think about the future. And on this final night of General Conference, I want to think with you together about what are some of these foundational principles that will hold us together when it seems like our culture is going crazy? If you have your phones, open up to the book of Chronicles. <laughs> or your devices, or you might even actually have a Bible with you. So the first principle that I want to lay out just in terms of a foundation for us as a family, a tribe going forward, is the reminder that our, our foundation is God's faithfulness. We are grounded in the faithfulness of our God. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 4. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised and with his mouth to my father David. And then verse 14. O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on the earth. You, have, you who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father. With your mouth you have promised, and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. As a movement, we are grounded in the foundation of God's faithfulness. We can see it throughout our story over and over again. The, the, the founding almost 160 years ago, this small band of radicals who within a generation or two planted churches across the country, founded colleges and Bible institutes, built homes for unwed mothers and social service institutions in, in just a, a few decades Amazing, amazing faithfulness that we've seen in our own story and our, in our history. We, we were early and passionate abolitionists. We, we believed in social justice when that wasn't the cool thing to do. It was in our DNA as a family. And our God is faithful. And we've seen the faithfulness of our God in our history. And tonight I just want to simply say to you that when it seems like the world is going crazy and we're not sure where things are coming from or what they mean, we are grounded in the faithfulness of our God. Amen. And that should give us hope Amen. and encouragement. Like the nation of Israel, we celebrate this amazing faithfulness of God. But we have to admit also we haven't always gotten it right, okay? We've made some really wonderful progress, but we haven't always done it right, and we're not exactly where we want to be as we're grounded in God's faithfulness. B.T. Roberts advocated for the full inclusion and ordination of women, but it wasn't until the 1970s that women were ordained, ordained as elders in the Free Methodist Church. That should cause us some pause. We recognize as well that this tribe that was founded with, the, with an abolitionist heart, if we're honest in our own story, we would have to say there, there has been racism in this tribe that we love, and that breaks our heart. That breaks the heart of God. But if we're going to talk about the faithfulness of God, we, we have to admit and recognize that we've not always gotten it right, and that is, uh, that, that's understandable. And in the ebb and the flow of life, God is faithful. And our foundation is God's faithfulness. And we see that over and over again. And I want to suggest to you tonight that one of the important foundations of our movement is looking back and seeing the faithfulness of our God. I also want to suggest to you tonight that that if our foundation is faithfulness, our commitment is to the whole gospel. 
Our commitment is to the whole gospel. There's some pretty radical things that Solomon says in this dedication service with the people of Israel. Verses 20, or 32 and 33 of Second Chronicles 6. Fasten your seatbelts. Listen to this. Solomon prays and he says, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you as, you, as do your people Israel and may know that this house I built bears your name. And in case that wasn't clear enough, let me also read from Leviticus 19. When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. I think, I think that's pretty clear, right? The stranger, the foreigner, the alien have a special place in the heart of our God. And I know there's great division in our country around immigration policy, and I understand that. And I recognize that it's a, it's a critical issue. I'm just simply saying, both for us as free Methodists and for us as people who, who uh, are grounded on the authority of God's word, it's very clear. It's very clear in the scriptures. I was thinking about some examples that we don't, we don't have to look very far around the world to see some in our own free Methodist family who are living out this biblical principle. You know that Impact Middle East is having an incredible ministry around the world. And in one of those countries where we see a God at work and we have a significant presence, Impact Middle East has made the decision through local churches to minister to uh, refugees that are there. In this particular country, millions of refugees who have come in. And Impact Middle East has said, we will reach out. We will love, we will come alongside, we will encourage, we will bring a cup of cold water, and we will bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for examples like that. Let me suggest that Solomon's prayer really has two different points of application. Many things that we could talk about, but two specific points of application that I want to reference tonight. Firstly, I want to just lift up a document that's on our uh, FMC website relating to immigration, written by Bishop David Roller and by Dr. Bruce Cromwell, about 2008, I believe. And they lay out some wonderful foundations for us as we think about particularly relating in this complex crisis of immigration. Listen to these words. This was a study commission on doctrine document. We say this, we provide venues to interact with both documented and undocumented immigrants to understand their stories and where they come from, their needs, their hopes, and their dreams. Secondly, we celebrate when a local church reaches people not like themselves with the good news of Jesus Christ because they are following well the Great Commission. And then finally, we actively seek out children that have been distanced from family by the deportation of undocumented parents and provide focused care for them. That was written in 2008. It sounds like it was written two weeks ago, doesn't it? And there's a whole lot we could say. And as I said, I suspect in this room, people are all over the map. I'm just, I just want to remind you 
that the priority in God's word and when Solomon is, uh, brings the people together to dedicate the temple, he pours his heart out to God in the dedication service and he says, God, remember the foreigner, remember the stranger, remember the alien. And shouldn't we, shouldn't we do the same? A second application from this plea of, of King Solomon, a second point of application also to talk about local churches and reaching out to people who have been distanced from God for whatever reason. And they talk about the nuns and the duns. People that have no faith or they're done or have had some kind of a negative experience. You know this, that the local church is the only institution that exists not only for people who are there, but for people who are not yet there. You know that, right? No, no amens? That's true. The local church exists for people who are there and for people who are not yet there. My question simply is this, it's not original with me, but if you think about the, the, that juxtaposition of, of people who are there, people who are not yet there, the question is, who gets served first? Who gets served first? I think there can really only be one answer to that question, and we're called to recognize that uh, as, as believers in the Lord Jesus, there are two fundamental kind of foundations to what we're about. The great commission and the greatest commandment. Faithfulness and fruitfulness. They're both important. They're both central to who we are as a people. George Barna recently reported in, in an article entitled Reviving Evangelism showed that millennials report many more faith conversations or even evangelistic encounters than do older non-Christians. For at least some young people, Barna concludes, there appears to be deeper interest in spirituality in general and in Christianity specifically. That should be an encouragement. For those of you that were in this room at the conclusion of general conference and, and we were able to witness this incredible move of the Holy Spirit, Pastor Kenny Martin came up and brought Superintendent Frazier Ventor and, and anointed and washed Superintendent Frazier's feet as a symbol of passing the faith on to the next generation. To some of us who are my age, I would say passing our faith on to our grandchildren. And so the question becomes, how, how far are we willing to go? How, how much are we willing to sacrifice so that people who don't know Jesus find a home in your local church and in my local church. We commit to the authority of God's word. We do. I want to say that tonight. We commit to the authority of the scriptures as our guide. And we hold loosely to personal preference. Right? Right? We're grounded on the authority of God's word, but, but preferences can, can change. Preferences can be different depending on an, an individual situation or the dynamics in a, in a local church. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in my role working with local churches, I find that, that preferences become holy. You know, preferences about the way we worship or some particular way the church is organized. Nothing to do with the essentials of who Jesus is or the authority of the scripture. But preferences about things that make me feel comfortable. Preferences about the way that I like to worship. The way that I've always worshipped. Now, I have to admit, I know this is the case. Sometimes pastors move too quickly. Sometimes pastors do stupid things. I'm a charter member of that club. I get it. I get it. 
But my heart goes out and embraces pastors and local churches who are asking the question, how can we be a place that is welcoming for people who don't know Jesus or for whatever reason have been distanced from him? Within the last year, my wife and I were in a church that shall remain nameless that was going through a major, major change and uh, just a whole series of things that were happening to help this church become a, a welcoming place for people who didn't know Jesus. And you, you know the story. You know the pain. You know the reality of what happens in a transition like that for people who've been at a church a long time and on this particular Sunday morning, just even a couple of months into the ministry of the new pastor, uh, Melanie and I were there and the service concluded and there was literally a line of people to talk to me. Uh, one of the joys of my job that I just love. And Melanie and I were standing there and a series of people that had complaints. The complaints were all about preference kinds of things, interestingly enough. Nobody was sacrificing the authority of the scripture, the divinity of Jesus. There wasn't heresy being preached, but things were changing. And I finally looked at Melanie and I said, uh, honey, you don't have to stay here and listen to this. Why don't you go to the car? She said, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But I'll never forget in my, you know, in my passion to try and explain what I knew the heart of the pastor was, that the change was to help the church again see people come to find Jesus and enfold it into the, into the family of God. And I said, you know, uh, we, wanna, we want the church to be a place that, that is, uh, is welcoming to new people, that is friendly to people that don't know everything we know. We don't know when to, they don't know when to stand up and sit down. They don't know all the traditions. We want them to feel comfortable. And this woman I was talking to you, Scouts Honor, Melanie was here for this one. She looked at me and she said, well, I think they need to feel a little uncomfortable. And I just... Kind of stopped and said, "Wow, I, I I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to respond to that." And as a as a movement, as a tribe, we're grounded in the the great commission and the greatest commandment. Faithfulness and fruitfulness are are both important, and we recognize that, and we honor and and we celebrate what God has done in this free Methodist family and at the conclusion of General Conference, we want to say, God, we thank you for your faithfulness and we want to acknowledge as well when we say, God, we are committed to the whole gospel that isn't just for me and mine. It's for the other, as our bishops have communicated so eloquently. The whole gospel for the whole world. Another foundation, our, our posture is humility, foundation of God's faithfulness, commitment to the whole gospel, a posture of humility. Listen to this, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 to 13, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest, the priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory had filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good, his love endures forever. Verse 14 of 2 Chronicles 14, this very, very well-known text, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Isn't it interesting that it's in the context of the dedication of the temple that we have this amazing declaration from the Lord about how we connect, how we find healing, 
humble themselves and pray. And so I would suggest to you that, that our posture as a family, as a tribe, has to be a posture of humility. They knelt on their, they knelt on their pavement with their faces to the ground. In God's presence, we recognize our sinfulness and God's holiness. Humility is so important. What does is, what is humility look like today? It's easy to talk about that. Just a, a couple of examples. First of all, a posture of humility is the recognition that we are all lost without Jesus. Amen. We have no corner on the gospel. Amen. We link arms together because of the power of the gospel. I love what Augustine said, there is no saint without a past, there is no sinner without a future. And it's important that we remember, we remember that. Also, we seek to connect with and listen to people with whom we disagree. Let me say that again. We seek to connect with and listen to people with whom we disagree. That great, uh, that great contemporary theologian, Dr. Phil, said it this way. <laughs> we want to be long on ears and short on mouth. Long on ears and short on mouth. And one of the, one of the challenges sometimes is that we only talk to people that we agree with. And a part of living in this, this posture of humility is said, you know what, I'm going to try to engage with and listen to and build relationships with some people that I perhaps even disagree with. And that doesn't mean we send them an email, by the way. You know that, of course. It means that we connect. Let's go out for coffee. Tell me your story. Tell me what's happening. I'm thankful for the conversations that I've been able to have with people that I disagree with. And I pray, Lord, help me to listen. Help me to listen and, and only speak when it's appropriate. You know, we are, we are holiness people, right? Yeah. We're birthed out of the 19th century holiness movement. And we understand that. I love the, uh, the most recent article that Dr. Kevin Minoya, former Bishop Minoya, wrote in Light and Life magazine. He says, we were the holiness people, marked by many restrictions, designed to signal a heightened spirituality and devotion to God. Sadly, these restrictions often became the essence of holiness. The idea of holy and holiness were voided by Christians and became best known by many as a synonym for antiquated rules. You know, as a, as a family of churches, as a tribe, we recognize that we strayed into legalism. And we admit that. We've talked about that, the clamping down of the, the Pentecost bands that really stopped the growth of the Free Methodist Church. And I, you know, I... I we invited Bishop Emeritus Les Krober to teach history and polity class for us in the Pacific Northwest Conference, and, and Bishop Les did an amazing job, and he said something that I've never understood before just a couple of years ago, and it was like the linchpin came together in my mind as I understood some of our history. So for example, if you've seen the, the pictures of the old free Methodists, they're, very, they're dressed very plainly. When my parents were married, in 1946, they didn't exchange wedding rings because that was, the, that was kind of the order of the day. But you know, you know the reason why free Methodists dressed simply and didn't have any what was called superfluous adornment? You know why that is? It was so the poor would feel comfortable coming into our churches. It wasn't because we were trying to appear to be more holy. It was so that the other would feel like they didn't have to dress up. They didn't have to wear fancy jewelry, that they could be a part of the body of Christ. But over the years, we began to define 
holiness in relationship to legalism. And what I want to suggest to you tonight that our understanding of holiness is bathed in, grounded in humility. Amen. Humility. Amen. Bishop Manoia goes on. He, said, he says, holiness is not something we do because, because it is a doctrine of behavior. Holiness is something that begins to be reflected in us as we are brought back into closer proximity with God. God's holy nature becomes more visible as we reflect God more. When you are in someone's proximity, that can happen. We begin to reflect those who are closest to us. So when we hang out with a holy God, we become holy as God is holy. I love what John Wesley says. I'm more and more convinced that the devil himself desires nothing more than this, that the people of any place be half awakened and then left to themselves to fall asleep again. <laughs> Friends, we're holiness people. And we have to find ways to talk ab about holiness in a 21st century context. And I love what Dr. Manoia says, that, that holiness is that, that understanding of, of the proximity of God and relationship with Jesus. That The more we hang out, the more we become like him. And as I think about the people that demonstrate holiness, I think about their incredible humility. And in this culture, there's, there's so much happening. And I believe by God's grace that as a people, we have to stand on the authority of God's word. No question about that. But I also believe that ch the church needs to demonstrate a spirit-empowered, God-ordained humility that says, we love you, we believe in you, and we will come and stand with you. As we think about the dedication of the temple, there also is a, a, just a very sad reality that we have to acknowledge, and that simply is to say that King Solomon did not finish well. He did not finish well. In fact, 1 Kings 11.14 says, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as David his father had been. At the end of Solomon's life, his heart was turned away from God, and, and Kings describes the reality that, that Solomon did not finish well. As a denomination... The future is before us, and I would suggest to you that the future is bright, but we've got to get some things right. We have to get some things right. And as I suggested to you that we're, we're grounded in God's faithfulness, God has been so incredibly faithful to our tribe. We're committed to the whole gospel, and our posture is humility. I love what, what Bishop Kendall wrote. In his blog post just a few weeks ago, he said, The story is of a relentless reaching for the broken and the lost. The story of rescue and ransom and of restoration through a people, then through a person, Jesus our Messiah, who was no fly-by Savior, but who entered the story in fleshing self among our kind to show us who we are and how we are meant to be to save and heal us and then to form us into new creation people who become a force in this world. A people who learn to be whole church on mission. So let me summarize what I'm trying to say. Here it is. Our future is bright. Our purpose is clear. Our God is sufficient. Amen. Amen.